AI is great at shipping code fast. It's also great at handing you a gnarly nested ball of spaghetti if you let it. It's possible that in the future we can treat our code entirely as a black box, that only the AI knows how it functions. But as of October 2025, that's currently not the case. And so beyond anything trivial, you're probably still going to need to crack open that black box of vibes. Over the past three decades, oh, geez, I'm old. Over the past three decades, I've dedicated myself to the craft of writing code that is not just functional, but also understandable and maintainable. Over years of projects, refactorings, and late night debugging sessions, I've developed and refined a set of patterns and practices that I personally use to prioritize human readability. Because here's the thing, code is read far more than it's written. So making it easy for the next person or probably future you or even AI to understand is super important. So that's what I want to talk about in this video. A bunch of practical tips and tricks that I've learned over the years that help my code feel much more readable and maintainable. I have got a lot to say here, so I've decided to break things up a little bit into a couple of different videos as this script was getting really quite long. So if you're interested in the other parts, then make sure uh, to like and subscribe this video and I will leave a link to them down below once they've been released. Oh, and by the way, most of this video is gonna be focused on TypeScript and React as that's what I have mostly been doing over the last decade or so of my career. Uh, but hopefully many of these principles will apply to other languages too. Anyways, without further ado, grab yourself a lovely cup of tea and let's get into it. All right, so let's kick things off by talking about some general tips and tricks and general conventions that I like to follow um, that uh, help keep the code clear and readable. And one of the most important things about doing that is keeping your functions short and sweet. I find that this really helps keep your um, logic on point and easy to reason about and test. If a function is getting too long, it's usually a sign that I need to go back and refactor something. The same goes for React components, which are just functions after all. So, and I'm gonna talk a lot more about React later in this video. Okay, next up is an important one for me that I use everywhere and it's early returns. Rather than having lots of nesting of if statements and loops of, in my functions, I almost always prefer a early out, more flat kind of structure. Note how by doing it this way, gets rid of a bunch of brackets and spare lines by bringing the return onto the same line so it reads more like a sentence of English. This kind of line by line, easy to read and understand code is generally what I strive for in my code base. Just to hammer it in, here's another example. This one's got lots of nested if statements and a for loop, which makes it really hard to reason about. So I would much prefer to write it like this. And I might even be tempted to write it in a more functional way like this. Now, naming things is probably one of the most important things you can do to make your code more readable. If done well, proper variable function and type names means that your code base becomes self-documenting, not just for you, your teammates, but also for AI. So naming things is such a big topic that I've decided to pull this one out of this video and into its own video. So make sure you get subscribed as you're not gonna to wanna to miss that one. I did just wanna mention it here in this video though, as I said, it's a very important part of making your code more human readable. So I didn't want you to think that I'd left it out. Now you saw a little bit of this one before, but I generally prefer to try and avoid using curly brackets where possible, particularly for single line if statements. So here we can see a ex simple example function with a few if statements. I find these, these curly brackets here on the if statements kind of superfluous. And so I would rather write it like this. So yeah, we got rid of a line, we got rid of a bunch of extra noisy syntax through the curly brackets. I personally find this much cleaner and, and easier to read than before. I think this is probably uh, more of an obvious one these days. It didn't always used to be the case, but I always uh, try and use const instead of var or let just about everywhere in my code base. Not only does this help with reasoning about what can and can't change from under you when writing your code, it also greatly assists the TypeScript compiler, allowing it to cover your ass in more circumstances than others. I guess the only kind of exceptions to using const everywhere is in tight loops or a very small function where I don't want to have to worry about recursion uh, or a while loop or something like that where the, view, the, the scope of the mutation is scoped to a very small area. I do also bend the rules a little bit sometimes for 
uh, arrays and sets, particularly in performance critical code. For example, I'm working on this project here uh, that I'll talk about in a future video uh, for a Christmas lights um, decoration that I'm working on at the moment. Get subscribed by the way if you want to see this. Uh, where I've got numerous uh, LED strings of lights that all have to update at 60 times a second. So a performance critical code here. So with 10 strings updating uh, 60 times a second, 200 LEDs, that's going to be a lot of updates. So, uh, so here I usually like to use uh, arrays and sets and just direct mutation instead of copying. Now, this one might just be me, but I'm personally not a fan of using the banger operator to negate a Boolean in a ternary operator. To me, this just makes things more confusing than it needs to be. Instead, just swap those two branches around so now the reader of your code doesn't have to first mentally invert that Boolean logic in their head. Similarly, I'm really allergic to using double bang for null conversion because famously like humans aren't very good at double negatives. So I just think that this is unnecessarily complex to understand. Instead, it's just best to use this Boolean function that's built right into JavaScript to do this null checking for you. And while we're on this kind of topic of using operators incorrectly, in my opinion, I usually don't use the double ampersand in React code to optionally render something. Instead, I prefer to explicitly write out the null case like this. In my opinion, this just reads better when you're scanning through the code base. In C Sharp, you can call methods using named arguments, like I've shown here. Uh, this makes it really clear which parameter represents what at the call site. And this is particularly useful when you've got many, many parameters for your function. JavaScript unfortunately doesn't have this feature natively, which makes it really tricky for the reader of your code to know exactly which of these arguments does what without using IDE features such as hovering over the function. So for this reason, I almost always use an object instead of a list of arguments for a function like so. I think this really helps with the readability of the code at the expense of maybe a little bit of extra memory due to the object allocation here. Also, if the function um, returns something as a result of its operation, and it's not obvious from the name of the function what that return value represents, then I will also often return an object with a field in an object with the return value inside of it, just to make it clear what that value represents. Okay, so this is a fairly large topic and I probably should do a whole video on this one, um, but it's important enough that I thought would cover here. And it's a, it's a feature that I've borrowed heavily from the functional world. So whenever I have situations where I have different kinds of something, I will generally create what's known as a discriminated union to represent that. So here, for example, we have a type that is a union of objects that is discriminated by this kind field here. I like to use the word kind instead of type, like you might see other people use, because I feel like type is kind of an overloaded term in TypeScript world, because it's, it's type of something. So now when we pass this payment method into this function here, process payment method, we can do something different in each case of this kind check. The key thing to understand here is that TypeScript is really smart because as you progress down here through the function, you've eliminated the types that this object can be. So TypeScript is, does what's known as type narrowing to reduce the, the, the type that it could be until we end up with a type right at the bottom, which is never. And the cool thing that TypeScript lets us do is check against this never type here through this exhaustive check function that I wrote. In my opinion, this is super powerful as your code base grows, it's very easy to forget to handle one of the additional um, shapes that your data can take, which can very easily lead to bugs. So if you write your code in this way, then you can just leverage the compiler to save you whenever you add a new kind to, this, to the list of your types. Oh, and the great thing about convex, and one of the big reasons I fell in love with it, is that it convex makes it super easy to extend this discriminated union pattern to your database layer as well. So for example, here is a part of the schema for my Christmas lights project. Here you can see we have a table where each row is gonna either be a string, folder, or switch. Then on the front end, 
I just discriminate over that kind to render the appropriate inspector. And this works just really well and helps keep your code super clean. I just like to use it wherever I can. You'll also note that in this code, I prefer to use a series of if statements with early returns rather than switch statements. So for example, here's what it would look like as a switch statement. For whatever reason, I just prefer a series of if statements. Maybe it's the separation line here between the switch and the top of each case. I don't know, but I just prefer a series of if statements. Anyway, just to hammer this in a little bit more, here's another example convex type from one of my projects. This union here represents the upload state for a file. It can be created, uploading, uploaded, or errored. Uh, it's clean and terse in my opinion. And here's another example, it's for a competition entry that has the status is the discriminator instead of kind. So you can see how this can be thought of as a state machine really, uh, where each state contains only the data that needs to be for that specific state. And you can see how easy it would be just to add extra states to your database as your project requirements change over time, which they inevitably will. And if you wanted to do this kind of uh, thing in a relational database like Postgres and MySQL, you typically have to either have a bunch of nullable fields or a great many tables with some complex join or materialized view or something over them to be able to access all of the entries. Oh, one last thing before I stop gushing about my love of discriminated unions is that if you are like me and you like to work this way, then you might be interested to check out this little known routing library called TypeRoute. I've used it in many projects to great effect. So at the top level, you define your routes like this using this create router function, which then gives you back a couple of type safe helpers. Then you can use them in your React components like this. So this should be fairly familiar to you given the examples that I showed you before. It's basically doing discriminated union and type narrowing. And this is all type safe thanks to the abilities of TypeScript and this type route library. Oh, by the way, if you were of the more functionally inclined person, you could also pull in another library, TS Pattern, which could tidy things up even more. Another one I have used in the past though is a library called Variant. This awesome little library tidies things up even more, allowing you to cosify this discriminated logic into your own helper functions like this match kind. In this example here, it does exactly what it sounds like. It matches the status by the given kind. And again, this is exhaustive, so if this ship blueprint type changes to add another kind, then the TypeScript compiler is gonna let us know that we need to handle it here as well. Okay, now let's talk about some React specific conventions I like to follow to keep my React code as human readable as possible. Firstly, the obvious one has got to be use convex. And I'm not just saying that because I'm now an official convex shill. Convex really does generally uh, massively simplify the cognitive load when writing clear and maintainable React code. The first tip uh, is something that I really like to do, which is to push my convex mutations and queries down and low into my components as possible without them actually entering the, the common components like buttons, labels, etc. So here in this example where we have this parent component, instead of passing this query down to the user profile subcomponent here, I much prefer to write it like this, where the user profile component itself takes no props and instead simply uses that uh, query hook instead. And because Convex deduplicates this data fetching logic for us, uh, you can safely use the same query all over your React app without any problems. The same concept goes for mutation. So rather than having a subcomponent uh, that lets a parent know that something happened, then the parent calls a mutation itself, I prefer to do it this style where the subcomponent does the calling of mutation itself. I find this localization of convex calls within the subcomponent helps minimize the size of your kind of conceptual unit within your application. So less dependencies from outside components just helps with that, that cognitive load. I personally generally like to keep one component per file in React. So I can keep the files quite small and focused. This is in keeping with my general principle of trying to keep the number of lines down in a file. The more components, types, and other things in the same file, the more you kind of need to load into your head when you load this into your mental RAM. 
You can also see in this example here, the Erda return technique that I talked about earlier coming into play in React code as well. Oh man, <laughs> this one frustrates me so much at the moment with AI. For whatever reason, all the current leading models just absolutely love to hoist these handlers away from where they're being used up here into the component body like this. So that just means like all this noise here, this const, this variable name, these types, they're just cluttering things up. You just, they just don't need them because they can just be aligned where they're being used. Yes, there are occasions where you might need to share some logic between multiple handlers, but I find these exceptions quite rare. And when you do have those exceptions, just create a function that can be used from those various handlers. I have got no idea why AI loves to do this, uh, but it does annoy me. <laughs> no matter how many times I try and spell it out in the guidelines I give it, AI still insists on doing this. Hopefully one day it won't. Generally when using convex mutations and React code, your inputs are usually quite short. So I find instead of doing this where we uh, do try catch, I prefer to inline the handler and remove lots of the brackets um, by using this fluent promise style instead of the try catch. Often with convex, your mutation is changing something in the database, which causes something else to happen in your React tree because it's got subscription to the data, uh, which generally means that you can get rid of this then here because usually it's not needed because something else will just update automatically. I also generally like to do a pass towards the end of the project, just to sprinkle on a little bit of optimistic updates to make things just feel a little bit nicer for the user which in this case will mean that this loading ind indicator goes away like this. And finally, I almost always like to create a generic error handler React hook uh, which to catch errors like so. So now that allows us to shorten our example to something like this. And just thinking about it, we could probably even take this a step further if we wanna get really clever. We could wrap our convex use mutation hook like this so we can catch the error automatically. So now that's gonna allow us to remove the error handling code from our component, leaving up with something like this, which in my opinion is super clean and nice. 95% of the time, you should probably just store your state in your convex tables and let the reactivity just flow through your app naturally. But there are times when you do need some local state. This is the case in that Christmas lights project that I'm working on at the moment. These LED strings need high frequency updates, which means that I can't really put them into the convex database. It would just be way, way, way too many updates, high frequency. So to avoid the prop drilling that might be associated with um, passing the state down to the lower components, I like to use a um, provider and react context at the parent level and then just have the children components access that context object. This dependency injection like pattern helps me keep the cognitive load down and makes the components more readable in my opinion. Whew. Okay, so I think I've now talked for long enough. Hopefully I haven't lost too many of you with this. There is however, so much more I could talk about that I'm definitely gonna have to do a follow-up video or several follow-up videos. In particular, I want to cover naming things, convex code layout, tooling and AI. Oh, and I touched a little bit on it, uh, but some of my little TypeScript helpers that I use in almost every project. So make sure you get subscribed if you wanna see those topics land into your feed. In the meantime, I've left links to all the things I talked about in this video in the description down below. And that's just about it from me for today. Until next time, thanks for watching. Cheerio.